yoga. Tina Tata Katoa, Salafalava, Assalamu alaikum. Today I have the tremendous privilege of interviewing this panel. Um, you know, just, um, yeah, and wondering how I got so lucky. Um, but um, I wanted to just um, start by um, introducing uh, these women who we've seen on the stage before. Uh, the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta, who made history as the first woman and the first wahine Māori to hold the foreign affairs portfolio in New Zealand. Tēnā koe te minita. Anne Nyoga is the chair of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She has been a member of the Sami Parliament of Finland since 2000 and has been working on reconciliation issues. Who is Anne? Also joining us today is Dr. Henemoa Elder, a New Zealand youth forensic scientist, professor of Indigenous research and author of Aroha, which has been selected for Oprah's book club. Tēnā koe takita. Now, before we move on to our questions, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge Tina Wilson, the director of the New Zealand Trade Development Centre in Taipei, who would have joined us today had it not been for flight difficulties. Tina was instrumental in establishing Te Aratini in her previous role as Director of Māori Business at New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, and she has been joining us from live stream. Ngā mihini kia koe, Tina, mō tō mahi. Um, just wanted to, to acknowledge that. Uh, and also, uh, Tina did send through some of her thoughts on Māori leadership, uh, and I just thought that would be a nice scene-setter before I launch into the questions. Uh, so when I asked uh, Tina what leadership meant to her, she said that leadership for me starts on our marae, where our pulse begins, always for our people, then radiates out into the many roles that we have. So I thought that was a nice segue into my first question, uh, which I will ask all of the panellists to answer. Can you please tell us what you bring from your culture into your respective leadership roles? I'll start with you, Minister. Oh, well, tēnā tātou katoa, tātou i hui hui mai nei mō te kaupapa. Um, I think what I bring is a lived experience about being raised in a little community uh, on my marae, um, some pretty simple happenings, uh, but some really rich teachings. Uh, and learning. Uh, so, you know, when I think about uh, the toolkit that I take with me, it is around lived experience. It's around the wisdom of the marae and the nannies and the kurus, the aunties and the uncles, but also uh, what I've learned uh, over time. Uh, and then a another key element will be education. My mother always believed that education was a pathway uh, to opportunity that had an influence on my whole family, including my dad. Uh, and perspective is another key element of my toolkit because I have great appreciation for other cultures. The more you understand your own culture, the more you can appreciate other cultures, and that makes a difference too. Thank you, Minister. Honey. Uh, baby, uh, the question itself, uh, made me to think what are our values in the Sami society and especially the values of the women. And in our society, in, like in all our other societies, women are the caretakers who are preserve the, that everybody has a good uh, circumstances in the society and nobody is left behind as nowadays slogan is. And when you transfer that uh, as in all our societies to the larger society of indigenous peoples globally, then, it, uh, then the right concept is solidarity. It is this, uh, that we come from the, Sami come from the Nordic countries, our living standards are better and so on, but that's, it is the solidarity to have the, all the other indigenous peoples to get the same circumstances as we have and to uh, uh, work 
towards the member states so that their rights are respected and recognized in their respective states. And that is solidarity for the other indigenous peoples. That's the most important, what I think we bring as uh, Sami women to the table. Thank you. So, when I think about what I bring from our culture and I think about the diversity within our Māori culture, uh, my experience is really about my ngāko Māori. Um, I haven't grown up on the marae. Uh, I'm like many of our people, I've grown up without our language, uh, with a mother who couldn't speak te reo and who had a lot of pain around um, what it meant to be Māori. I, I've come from a culture where there's been mental health, mental health problems in our whānau, and as many of you will know, my younger brother took his own life many years ago now. So all of those things are part of my culture of being Māori um, and have, have led me uh, into the the leadership roles, I suppose, that I hold. Other people talk about me like that. I don't actually feel that I'm here to serve our people. Um, so the examples and the, and the supports that I've had around me over the years from those who've passed on to become a doctor, to become a psychiatrist, to become a child and adolescent psychiatrist, Māori, to really kick down a lot of doors, to be honest. I feel like that's a big part of my role and create space and flow. Uh, that's, that's the kind of culture uh, in terms of te ao Māori that I bring forward. Mm. Minister, you were a very visible representation of your culture. Um, could you please tell us about uh, your journey to get your moko way? Well, I mean, I think people make a, a decision uh, at some point in their life about uh, how they want to be. Some people call it the aha moment or just when the penny drops and things like that. For me, it was a range of milestones that had happened in my life and also um, milestones that had impacted on my life that I got to a point where I thought, actually, it's time. It's time to... Um, bring forward um, uh, all these milestones in a way that they will be with me for life and um, receiving my mokokauai alongside uh, 13 other women um, from within my marae was the wānanga that we created. I'll give you one um, perhaps insight into the step that, that we went through as a collective group of women who had never really seen queer of our time um, and it was of our great-great-grandmother's time was the last queer we saw the Mukokowai on our marae. So we, went, we had a wānanga, and for different reasons, the women uh, had identified milestones in their life where they too wanted to uh, recognise uh, achievements. But we had to go through a whole conversation around permissions, uh, worthiness, um, grief, um, uh, and... As we had a wānanga around all these things, it actually became more apparent that it was a necessary step forward towards receiving a mukukau wai that would actually represent everything that uh, the women in our, in our kāhui were um, staking claim to or asserting themselves for. And it was, that, that as a process in itself was empowering uh, for women um, our youngest recipient of her mokokauai at the time was 17 and our oldest would have been about 60, 63. So we had everything in between. Um, and uh, we received our, our mokokauai in our marae and the whānau all turned up because it had never been done on our marae for such a long time. But the learning and the wisdom was the wānanga and the way in which our whānau came around and supported what was happening. And then ever since then, throughout every marae on our, uh, amongst our iwi, uh, it's just grown from strength to strength. Um, it's a humbling um, uh, experience. Uh, the kaita, when he 
I uh, finished uh, my kawai, he said, ko tō hoa haere, ko tāmukung, uh, ko tāngia kei rungi aku. And I thought to myself, wow, <laughs> you know, that's, that's it, you know. Um, and I felt hugely uh, privileged, and I'm always mindful uh, now um, that the um, opportunity that I have to share um, the, the wisdom that's been handed down um, so that I can be a benefactor or a recipient, um, but also a good um, carer of that wisdom can happen. So, yeah. Yeah. It's um, really beautiful to see you as a wahine Māori standing in your power on the world stage. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, Dr. Hinemoa, uh, for years you were one of the most recognisable faces on New Zealand TV. Uh, can you tell us about uh, your journey to learning te reo Māori? Oof, just a small question then. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, the thing about learning our reo for me has been right from the beginning. When I started learning it, even though it was super hard, it gave me such a feeling of joy and happiness. And so when I speak our language, I, I always have that sense. Uh, so I went to my first kura reo in 2007 and uh, the way Hiroi was there, one of our um, beautiful, beautiful leaders from Te Tai Tokero and one of my relations from Opodi. And um, he, he could see that I was literally a stunned mullet. And um, so he was very helpful and he said, yeah, yeah, I can see that stunned mullet there. Uh, so I, I've, I've moved forward from the stunned mullet phase and I rejoice in it. Ahako, you know, nga he, nga hapa. Um, it's about speaking it. And, you know, we're at a meeting about um, economics, if you like, and a sense of abundance and resourcefulness. And in very tangible ways, speaking our reo has opened up a lot of job opportunities for me. Um, certainly my role at uh, Brain Research New Zealand for six years. I don't think I could have done that, performed that role in the way that I attempted to without being able to speak, without being able to really communicate with our, with our senior people in the community. So it's, uh, it's an ever-ending journey and I love it and I encourage all of our all of our people here and all of our people at home, our other generations, to, to embrace it. As Fire Moy Milne says, when you speak, when you reclaim our language, when you come home to our language, you listen to a different voice, you have a different reo. And um, I, do, I do like the reo that my tongue finds when I speak te reo Māori. Mm, thank you. Ane, um, you mentioned uh, to me yesterday when I was asking about how to greet you in your language that uh, uh, Sami has not been translated on Google Translate yet. Could you tell us a little bit about the situation um, of Sami language speakers um, in your country? Uh, in Sami people live in four different countries, in uh, Russia, Norway, Finland and Sweden. And there are about 100,000 Sami. And uh, there, the, we have, Sami have 10, nowadays, 10 different uh, officially recognized Sami languages, and three of them are in my country, in Finland. And I speak, my mother tongue is Northern Sami, uh, which is spoken in Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And uh, I learned uh, Finnish when I went to the boarding school in the age of six, so... I have that boarding school history, but I was lucky to be there just one year because the education, cha uh, the laws, cha legislation changed. But for example, in my area, almost uh, in my municipality, 70% uh, are Sami, and almost all the Sami speak Sami as a mother tongue. Mm -hmm. But then the, there in other regions, the, uh, at, at this time, I don't know the exact numbers, how many Sa there are Sami speaking who speak mother tongue, but uh, maybe it's almost half. But of course, with the smaller languages, which are under uh, extinction to die, in the threat of uh, extinction to die, it's much more difficult, the situation. 
but we have managed to take um, the, we have taken the models from here, from New Zealand, from Wales, and uh, take the models of uh, teaching in kindergartens, Sami language, and so uh, that has worked well, and one of the Sami languages called Sami has been said with that one. And of course, in Finland, we have, uh, we have a subjective right to take in our mother tongue, uh, to take our kids to the kindergarten. So, for example, me being Sami, I can ask anywhere in Finland that my kid should have a kindergarten teaching the daycare in the Sami language. But that doesn't apply to Norway nor Sweden. So we are very privileged in that sense. And so, for example, in my case, my old, uh, younger daughter didn't, we didn't get a daycare in the Sami in the, uh, one of the towns, Nordic towns. So I took that to the court and the court order. Court decided that if the town doesn't organize daycare in two weeks, then the town will get a fine. And we were, uh, we were stated to be discriminated by the town municipalities. So that way we got the daycare for the whole Finland in the Sami. So anywhere a parent can apply. It's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that sharing Indigenous knowledge has made an impact, which leads nicely into my next question for the Minister. Um, Minister, do you, th do you think that um, we can bring indig indigeneity into our foreign policy to build bridges? Well, I'm trying. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're on a new journey, I think, as a country, which enables us to take the next progressive step forward um, to do a number of things. Firstly, uh, that the treaty, uh, recognising that the Treaty of Waitangi is a living document, we need to reflect it across all elements of our society, the way in which it applies to the judiciary, into the executive, through policy, into uh, legislation. So, you know, we're on a journey. We are by no means perfect, but I think where we have matured our uh, approach, uh, we are now in the situation where we can... Uh, bring the very best of uh, Māori uh, perspectives, a Treaty of Waitangi-sensitive um, approach, uh, as well as our values, Māori values, towards foreign policy. And the reason why I think the time is now more than ever before is because the wisdom, the inherent wisdom of Indigenous peoples is very much aligned to the ch big challenges of our time, climate change you know, doing no more harm on the environment uh, than what we have inherited, and then perhaps to try and do a little bit more good along the way for our kids and, and their kids. Uh, but also when we think about a range of geostrategic challenges uh, and um, the balancing impact of the applied indigeneity to the way in which foreign policy um, might uh, re reimagine, re-envisage, re, re, restate um, uh, that it's not just about economics. And while, while that's, that does help, when we think about um, building back better, which is a current narrative amongst uh, many countries, in fact, it was a very strong focus uh, at APEC, building back better from a New Zealand context, if we could have any hope to influence a different way, meant the inclusion of indigenous economies and Indigenous perspectives and how each economy started to uh, provide for space for that to come through in both innovative ways, but also in ways that could be seen and counted towards building greater prosperity. So I think we're trying. Um, New Zealand um, is realistic that, um, you know, we don't have all the answers, but if we can be a drop in, in the river that ripples out, and creates waves around opportunity for Indigenous peoples, then I know there's a heck of a lot of people that want to work towards that objective. And it can be a New Zealand advantage. That's the thing. It can be to New Zealand's advantage. So we'll see how we go. Well, thank you, Minister, for outlining those challenges and New Zealand's ideas on how to address them. Just wonder if, Annie, you could um, let us know from the UN's perspective um, how can we address the challenges that Indigenous people face and how can we, um, yeah, how can they realise their, their, their human rights to economic prosperity? Um, 
if, before answering to that question. May I uh, continue what you just said? It is really a delight to hear about the, uh, from the member state and foreign minister stating these words. And when uh, we at the Permanent Forum, we have a mandate to work with uh, UN, different UN agencies, programs and so on. And uh, so we negotiate with different specialized agencies, UNICEF, uh, UNESCO, FAO, ILO and so on. And in many cases, uh, the, members, uh, the member states donate to different UN uh, agencies funding. And it is uh, one of the possible ways for member states to, uh, to take indigenous peoples and their, uh, their, them into account is earmark the funding to the UN system for indigenous peoples and programs. So uh, that would help them at the grassroots level level, for, for example, when in different agencies the programs are built and policies created for indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And the question was that what it, uh, how would help the economic growth? This would be one of the possibilities to do that. So through the UN, but of course the direct, uh, uh, direct funding is also. But then what is, when we look at the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, it is also, we always speak about self-determination and part of the self-determination being indigenous is our rights to the lands, uh, territories and natural resources. If we are denied to have access to our lands, that has a huge impact on our economic uh, survival. So that is one of the key issues, which is really important to guarantee that we have access to the lands. We are part of the decision-making and then, uh, therefore, we can uh, decide what we want to do. And of course, part of the self-determination is to decide if we want to have a self-governance of our own, or we want to have the co-management with, uh, uh, with the government, and so on. So I think that uh, basis for our economic uh, development is access to land. So we've just had a national perspective, an international perspective. And now, Dr. Hinemoa, I'm going to ask you, um, your book, Aroha, draws on ancient wisdom. Uh, and what can we find from our ancient wisdom that helps us with the well-being of our communities in today's world? Mm. So uh, there is so much in these, in, in Whakatauki and Whakataiwaki and all sorts of other aspects of our tukanga. You know, I think of, of these short uh, proverbial sayings which are easy to remember because they paint such a vivid picture and they help us to look through the eyes of our tupuna at the natural world and draw lessons from that. What, what I've found is certainly the feedback I've had from, from readers around the world of, of, my, of my little book is that there is this profound longing at the moment, particularly now in COVID, but also with the layers of climate emergency, extreme weather events, for people to draw some sort of certainty back into their lives and to strengthen the relationship with Papatunku, with Tangaroa, with uh, uh, tāne, uh, the ngahere, because those things are so literally grounding. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting reciprocal relationship, isn't it? Because I think certainly we experience uh, a diminution in our potential for mental well-being because of the devastation that's happening to Papatūnuku, to Tangaroa, and so do they, so do those deities, so do those atua. And the, and the reverse is true. When we use whakatauki, whakatawaki to really be in that moment and observe those aspects of the natural world and to draw on those for strength and to use those to propel us into action, to take care, to, to reclaim this kaitaki role that is at the heart of a, a really positive aspect of our well-being, then we're going to be more nurturing, we're going to find creative um, endeavours, uh, economies, 
around uh, healing, which is healing for our planet, our Mother Earth, and for ourselves. So for me, our, our tikanga actually draws us back uh, very, very efficiently. You know, that these things have remained relevant because they still resonate with us. Things are lost that, that don't continue to have some sort of relevance, but they do. And, and what's been fascinating for me is that our, our tikanga Māori is, is such a leadership model for other cultures around the world. And we've, we've seen, haven't we, with the Emirati people, all the connectivity that we experience with our tuakana here. They have their own whakatauki, whakatauaki. And we have ours, they have hongi, we have hongi, and so many other things. So it's, it's a puna, it's a huge wellspring of potential for our mental well-being and the well-being of our Mother Earth. Mm. You're just picking up on your point. Oh. Yeah. Cool. Picking up on that point, um, Minister, you are part of one of the most diverse cabinets that we've had. What has it meant to have more Māori at the table, more Pacifica at the table, more women at the table? Oh, look, it's been huge, and I think it's a signal of uh, just how far we have come as a country, and it hasn't happened by accident. I think we have a Prime Minister who is leading for her generation for this time and have identified some significant global challenges that will be New Zealand's, you know, um, I guess a, a defining feature of how she will uh, lead. Um, and then COVID happened, you know, so climate change, um, a strong uh, health-focused response to COVID and then the way in which we recover um, will be defining uh, features uh, alongside addressing issues to do with uh, child poverty. Um, so when I look at the diversity in our, our Cabinet, I think that has been quite deliberate because there is a generational shift in leadership in New Zealand uh, that is prepared to venture f more forward into New Zealand's sense of self and maturing identity than I've experienced over the 25 years that I've been uh, in, in politics. I feel I'm well equipped to be able to say that. Um, with that comes a huge amount of responsibility because, uh, you know, there are, there, there are resistance, um, uh, there is resistance to some aspects of what that forward starts to look and feel like. And we've just got to be mindful all the time that while we must have ambition as a country, um, we are far better trying to move forward when everyone sees the merit and where that, where that future and where that destination um, is. And that's, that becomes a political challenge for us because we must be able to demonstrate every step of the way the reason why we're leaning forward towards a New Zealand that is more inclusive, that is uh, taking greater cognizance of the, the place of the treaty, that embraces diversity because cultural diversity adds um, depth and dynamism to the innovative side of our who we are as a young nation. You know, we've got to continue to tell that story um, and that's our job. But that, that's pretty much why the Cabinet's the way it is. And, and I think the people of New Zealand, when they made a decision about, you know, what the future could look like, um, have given us a huge mandate to continue uh, into that space. And we're very mindful uh, that we cannot take that support for granted, uh, that it is beholden on our diversity to be able to speak to the aspirations of all New Zealanders. So um, just being cognizant of um, you know, how we bring community voices along when we sit at those tables. Um, Dr Hinemoa, you, you have been on various boards throughout your career. How do you bring that community voice along with you? In many ways is the short answer. So um, one of the things that I'm always mindful of is seizing opportunities to bring the voices of all of those that go with me, whether you can see them or not. Um, we feel them, don't we, traveling with us all the time. So um, I suppose it's about the style of what we invite in these groups that we're part of, the style of interaction and, 
And one of the things that I use is simply whakawhanaungatanga. So when we do use this ancient technology uh, passed down from our tupuna, we're actually talking about all the voices that we're bringing, all the connections that we're bringing, and actively seeking out the connections amongst that group that actually ripple out, as you were saying, Minister, into, into the wider awa uh, that we're part of, um, and I'm very much inspired by our, our Whanganui River Farno and the, the Awatapu, which um, is such a powerful metaphor for exactly what we're talking about, bringing all the strands, all those um, droplets of water that converge at this uh, special, just like an aratini. Uh, so the, the aratini is a great way to think about that, that resonates for me. So we're running out of time, but I have one more question for each of you, and I'm going to start with you, Anne. Um, what advice do you have for Indigenous women who want to become more involved in decision-making? Mm. Uh, Indigenous pe pe uh, women who want to be involved in decision-making, it's uh, if you want to be involved in the majority society, uh, then the advice is you have to uh, learn the, from the wisdom of your ancestors, your grandparents, parents, and learn the uh, indigenous knowledge is there. Be curious, ask questions, and listen to those stories again and again, because you are the one who will repeat them to your daughters, your, uh, your grandchildren. And then, uh, then also when you go to the Western society and want to be sitting in these decision-making tables, you need to have education. And education is a key to succeed outside the indigenous society. So in order to be, uh, be survive, become leader in both of the societies, you need to have uh, respect. And earning respect is learning your indigenous knowledge in your own society and then in Western society, education. And when you combine those and are able to carry them forward, then that helps you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Well. Any, any advice? Um, very briefly, I think um, I, I don't want to give advice because uh, there are so many ways for all of us, different indigenous women, to arrive at our own evolution of learning about Decision making. What I would say is a couple of things. Um, let's not be afraid of showing emotion. What I've experienced, particularly this morning, is that um, we feel things and we express it. And we're often, uh, we get messages from around us that maybe being emotional is not something that's valuable. Actually, I think it's one of our great strengths. So think about uh, showing your emotions when you're involved in decision making. The second thing I'd say is, we're making decisions every day in everyday life and we can practice um, and learn about our own strengths and the things that we perhaps feel less comfortable with around decision making in, in, our, in our own lives and then build on that for other settings which might hold different sets of responsibilities. Thank you. And final word from the Minister. 150% mm, be courageous. Keep moving forward. Don't let uh, anything uh, dull what is inherently yours and has always been yours and been passed down to be yours. Uh, because there's, there's strength and wisdom in that and it can act as a light to guide the way. The other thing is that I would say that um, success, while success breeds success because we can lift people up, failure is actually a greater determinant of character. Mm. And you have to keep getting up. You have to get back up and get on the horse. No matter what people tell you, society is a great, um, has a great way of trying to put a ceiling on how far you can go because you're a woman, you're too young, you haven't had enough experience. Um, this isn't the kind of uh, professional pathway that you're cut out to be. All of those conditional 
kind of microaggressions that you might feel, keep getting up. Make sure you've got a strong kapi around you that gives you great spiritual strength because you'll need it um, for the physical challenges that come your way. But keep getting up. Keep moving forward. Take everything that you were gifted with you because over time, that is uh, a strong toolkit to help you navigate your way. Thank you for the nourishment that you've provided uh, for us today. Please give them a round of applause.